Welcome to Cybersecurity Strategies and Best Practices from Tech Commanders. I'm really excited that you're here to join the course, and this course was really devised to help provide you insight into how cybersecurity operations works and how we use different strategies, operations, controls, and best practices in a larger enterprise. This course could also provide someone new to IT or even cybersecurity the ability to see what their jobs may entail if they choose a career in cybersecurity as well. The course will provide you the presentation, a companion ebook, and also some infographics. The course expectations is really to help you understand the importance of cybersecurity, to help you with skill development, preparedness for any cybersecurity roles that may be of interest to you, and also help you understand some of the risk management techniques. The course itself has six modules. We'll first dive into security architecture. We'll then talk about operations. We'll then talk about application security physical security, threat intelligence, and risk assessments. We have a lot to cover in the course, so let's go ahead and get started. Before we get started with the course, let's get through a short introduction to your instructor. My name is Joe Holbrook. I'm the CLO of Tech Commanders here in Jacksonville, Florida. I've had the opportunity to work in IT for over 25 years. And I've held a number of different roles in a number of different capacities as well. I've had the opportunity to work with both federal integrators and also commercial companies as well. And when it comes to certifications, I hold a number of different certifications. And I also have been widely published in a number of different areas as well. Lastly, I'm also a U.S. Navy veteran. So with that said, let's proceed to the next lesson. Before we get started with the course, please do make sure you download the course content. The presentation is included. There's also a companion ebook as well, some infographics and crib sheets. Let's go ahead and proceed to the next lesson. Welcome to Module 1, Security Architecture. In this module, we want to really understand the fundamentals around a secure architecture, specifically for our enterprise environments. The first lesson, we want to talk about why cybersecurity is so important for the enterprise. We'll talk about cybersecurity architecture, what that really means, talk about data protection, cryptography, network design. We'll go through a whiteboard and discuss network design visually. And then I'll talk about single points of failure as well. And I'll go through a whiteboard around single point of failure. We have a lot to cover in this module, so let's proceed to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's talk about cybersecurity and understand why it's so important. Cybersecurity is so critical to organizations because of the fact that they have to protect their data. The data to the company is typically the most important asset of the company, and therefore if we have a data breach, this can be a really big deal. So cybersecurity has to take a priority seat in the world of the enterprise environment, and hopefully in small and mid-sized businesses as well. Now, when it comes to cybersecurity, there's a number of different roles. There's a number of different practice areas as well. You could be a cybersecurity operations specialist, a security engineer designing the network pieces for security. You could be working in a help desk as an analyst. You could be the one that is managing the day-to-day -day activity as well. So when it comes to cybersecurity, there's a number of different roles, practice areas that you could specialize in as well. You could work with on-premise equipment or in the cloud as well. So becoming a cybersecurity professional is a great idea. 
But also, if you're taking the course just to get an idea about cybersecurity, this is another great way for you to increase your knowledge and also help as well with your career development. So with the course, we have a lot to cover, so let's go ahead and get started and learn more about cybersecurity. Cybersecurity Architecture In this lesson, let's really understand what exactly is a cybersecurity architecture and why it's so important. Now, when it comes to defining this cybersecurity architecture, it's really focused more on the structure and the behavior of your enterprise network. You could think about it as having this backbone in your company that is really focused on maintaining the control, the order, even the sanity of what happens on your corporate network. As an example, if you're going to access the company network from outside of your company, you typically need to go through at least a step or two to get in, right? So you need to have, of course, a virtual private network connection. You generally need to have additional layers of passwords, maybe two-factor authentication as well. And it's really just meant to make sure that the activity that actually occurs on your network is going to really play into mitigating risk. And that's really what it really should come down to at a high level. So we want to think about that the cybersecurity architecture is going to benefit the organization to reduce risk. It's really about protecting the company. Now, when it comes to different components of this cybersecurity architecture, we're going to, of course, be looking at everything from firewalls to NIDSs and HIDSs. We're going to be looking at as well uh, to have additional layers added to our network. So for example, we're going to need to consider defense in depth. We're going to need to consider as well having additional software programs that are going to look for potential breaches in privacy, like data loss prevention, having MDM in place, right? So there's so many things to consider. When it comes to really understanding the foundation of the organization, it's really, again, coming down to protecting the network, protecting the enterprise against risk. So having a proper cyber security posture is so important. And it's going to, of course, have multiple layers, standards, practices, and entail security professionals to really make this all work. When it comes to components and layers, we need to have network security. That, of course, is going to entail what? Our firewalls our routers and switches, right? That network component that builds a physical architecture. We also have our host security. We need to have antivirus. We need to have HIDSs, probably a host firewall as well. Endpoint security. We also, of course, need to have IDS involved in our endpoints. We also need to look at data security. How do we control access to our network shares, for example. Application security. Are we developing our applications in a secure manner? Do we use SDLC, for example? Compliance, of course, goes without saying, right? It's a big deal. Are we maintaining the proper governance over our enterprise assets? And compliance would, of course, come into that. Do we have threat intelligence set up? Are we actually determining our security posture? Are we looking at potential vulnerabilities? Are we scanning our networks, right? Are we going out to the internet? Do we have subscription feeds from different vendors letting us know of vulnerabilities? Do we have a cyber response team in place? This again is a big deal. 
When it comes to frameworks for our cybersecurity architecture, it's really important to realize that there's only really a few widely used on the market. So that's really going to boil down to the open security architecture, the Shorewood applied business security architecture, and the open group architecture known as TOGAF. Now, there's also AWS. So AWS is really focused on what? Their own cloud services. Now, OSA is open security architecture. This is going to really be an add-on to either SABSA or TOGAF. And it's going to be typically what I've seen is more or less going to be focused on the technical and functional controls. So it's very comprehensive in the sense of how different security components are applied, how we would apply best practices, etc. Generally, again, we only want to use this when we've already designed our network. SAMHSA is going to be widely used, and it's really focused on typically understanding how we deploy something, why we deploy something, and how it all comes together. So this is really policy driven. That's really what SAPS is known for. It is widely used in enterprise IT management. And it, again, is more high level functional. It's not deep dive like OSA. So just be aware that, again, like I was saying, OSA is typically bolted onto SABSA and TOGAF environments. Now, TOGAF is really going to help the enterprise understand how their security infrastructure can really be applied to their business. The goal is to look at the, at the organization's main business goals and scope and really understand how the security architecture can play into that. It really, again, is not specific as as we would get in the OSA from a technical perspective. And then when we talk about AWS, AWS is very specific in how you apply services and deploy uh, services, connect on-prem, etc. to AWS. So just be aware of that. Now, when it comes to the four phases of a cybersecurity architecture, we're really looking at first the assessment, really understanding where we are, where we need to go. Then the second phase is going to be design. This is where we have to understand, okay, we need to have a firewall. We need to have data loss prevention. We need to understand IAM. Then after that, we have to implement these phases. And that's where we put into place the proper people, get the resources, and actually make it all happen. And then once we have it all deployed in place, we then need to really get to the point where we can monitor and operate our cybersecurity architecture. So just be aware that there's, of course, a lot more that goes into this. But from a high-level perspective, we want to understand that having different phases in our architecture can really help different controls. Understanding the high-level perspective will help us from an enterprise perspective to know where we are and where we need to go. So with that said, let's move on to the next lesson. CIA Triad, Confidentiality, Integrity, and Availability. Now, the CIA Triad is a well-known staple in the world of IT security. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, we have to consider that every practice, whether it is networking or storage or, in this case, security, has some foundational concepts that we must be aware of. Now, the CIA triad is going to be a framework that we're going to want to reference routinely when it comes to designing our systems, especially when we're looking at an enterprise organization. Because the reality is, is if we try to do too much over here, it could affect something over there. So the CIA triad is really about understanding the compromises between confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And so when we consider confidentiality, 
integrity availability, just be aware that these specific components are really fundamental for us to understand before we actually deploy anything in our environment. Confidentiality. This is information that cannot be understood by anyone for whom it was unintended. Well, what does that really mean? Well, if we have information in a network, as an example, hosted on some host in our network, we don't want that data to be able to be not only read, but understood, but stolen as well. And so if we're able to maintain confidentiality through having the proper... When it comes to integrity, we want to make sure that the information cannot be altered in storage or in transit. Well, really it comes down to making sure that if information is added, modified, deleted, etc., that we have a trail to be able to document that. Now, we also want to make sure we have protections in place to also validate that the information is good. And we'll talk about how we could use, for example, hashing as just one of the tools to be able to accomplish that. Availability. We want to make sure that our information is available when we want to use it. So how do we, in our design, actually enforce this or actually design it into our application architecture, let's say? Well, we want to make sure we have pins and passwords, encryption and secrets, part of our application structure or basically host access structure. Simply put, our IAM management has this all comprised. When it comes to integrity, we want to look at hashing and checksums as a way we could use to validate that the software is exactly what we expect it to be from a size perspective or a file type. The way we might want to accomplish that, again, is through, let's say, a checksum. Now, if I go to a repository, if I go to a web page and the publisher has published software, they usually have some kind of a checksum that you could validate that this is the right file size and structure and time and everything. Availability. We want to make sure that the information is available when the users need to use it, when we want to use it, and the way we accomplish that is through backups, having failover, high availability, replication. These are some of the ways that we could really enforce the availability practice in our environments. Now, there's certainly a lot more capabilities we could add to this, but for this course, we want to keep it fairly straightforward and fairly uh, high level in that sense. So with that said, let's move on to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's talk about data protection. Now, data is likely the enterprise's most valuable asset. It's what really provides the enterprise, your company, the ability to make the right decisions at the right time. And so because of that, companies need to protect their data. Companies also may use data in different approaches and different forms for various types of purposes, whether they actually create products that collect data or they create products and solutions that may actually use data and provide a different output of the same data. However, that data is being employed, maintained, it is critical to the enterprise to have it available and to make sure it's not altered, to make sure it's not stolen, right? So we need to have data protection. So data protection is a process of preventing data from being lost, corrupted, or stolen. We want to make sure the data is available. And we also need to be aware there's a lot of best practices, technologies available, and other types of services we could employ to protect our data. When it comes to data discovery, we, of course, need to identify what data is important and what may not be as important. In other words, do we maintain certain types of data in different ways than other types of data. 
For example, if you are in the U.S. government, you're going to likely have multiple levels of data protection based on the type of data. Also, too, how you can access the data will be very different. So that data may be actually considered national security, could be sensitive, and same thing in companies. So, for example, if you're a startup company, let's say a small startup, you may not really maintain anything appropriately. But as you become an enterprise, you realize that, okay, well, we have technical drawings. We have technical patent information that we want to maintain and make sure that we protect so that this is actually our company information. In other words, we like to refer to that as a secret sauce. In other words, this is what makes the company the company, right? It's so important that that data is protected. It's not stolen and given away to a foreign country. So if you're a company like Google, you probably don't want to have the algorithms that were created specifically for your search engine to be stolen and manipulated or vice versa, or whatever, whatever can happen, right? So it's important that we identify the data and then we figure out how we protect it. Now, data loss prevention is actually a fairly new technology in the sense that we can employ systems that actually can look at the data, scan the data before it leaves the network or before it's copied onto a USB drive. So this is really important because one thing that DLP can help with is to make sure that companies avoid breaches that expose privacy information, health data. Now there's a lot of storage technologies that do have built-in protection. For example, if you buy a storage array or you buy even a lot of the network switches, they have redundancy built in so that if one disk drive goes down, there's another still copying data or maintaining the running configuration, for example. Okay, backups are so straightforward, we probably don't need to talk about it, but having a backup, right, is, is what? Critical, because if that information is stolen, if it's accidentally deleted, whatever can happen, we can recover. Snapshots. This is another form of really a backup in the sense it provides restoration of the data. Replication. Now, this is very important as well. So having a backup is great. But what happens if the location of your backup gets hit with the fire? Or you're in San Francisco and there's an earthquake or you're in New York City and there is a, a blizzard that wipes out electricity for a week, right? Whatever can happen, we need to have data available at another location. Firewalls, being able to make sure that the proper access to the network is granted as well as the types of services that run. So having very specific ports open and very specific ones closed is going to be very important. Encryption is another approach we could use to, of course, make the data unreadable to those that don't have the proper keys to review the data, to access the data. So let's move on to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's talk about cryptography. Now, cryptography is the art of protecting information. Well, what does that really mean? Well, cryptography is a practice that's been around for well over a century, in, in a lot of cases, depending on who, uh, who you talk to and what you read. But when we consider cryptography, it's really meant to mask the information. It's meant to protect the information. And it uses an algorithm to do that. And specifically, when we say algorithm, it's really a mathematical technique that is applied to the data while it's either being written or being stored so that you need to have the proper key to be able to read it. 
So the goal is to protect the data in transit and also at rest. Now there's different types of cryptography. We have symmetric key cryptography. This is where we would have the same key and it would be applied to encrypt and decrypt the data. Now this type of cryptography is used typically on a local disk drive, let's say on your laptop or in a storage array. And that's because generally the access to the system is pretty limited. Now public key cryptography is going to have two different keys. So if you're gonna send an email, for example, that's encrypted, you need to have a private key and you also need a public key to be able to do that. And lastly, we have hashing. This is a common way that we want to validate that the data is what it says it is, the proper length, for example. But also with hashing, we could apply it in use cases, especially in blockchain technology. It's widely used. And there's certainly a lot of other various types of cryptography, encryption we could use. But for, for this specific course, we want to, again, keep it at more of the practice level and not the deep technical level. For those interested in learning more about cryptography, look into the courses I've created around encryption and blockchain as well as IT security. Dive into the various algorithms and applications in much more detail. But for this course, let's move on to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's talk about defense in depth. Now, it's so important we take the macro view for security, and defense in depth was actually coined by the Department of Defense in the U.S. So what does that really mean to the world of commercial IT security or best practices in the world of cloud computing even? Well, what it really means is that we need to take a look at how we protect our data. We need to have the right controls in place. So defense in depth is really about prescribing multiple redundant controls or measures to make sure that a vulnerability is really going to, if it is exploited, will not be able to succeed because there's other controls to stop it. Now, the concept of defense in depth comes from military strategy where let's say you're an army and that army needs to protect a perimeter, they're going to do that with, of course, physical controls, air defense controls. They're going to have electronic controls, sight con visual controls, whatever you want to call it, right? So there's so many things that we could have in place from a network perspective or a data perspective to maintain our network, just as an example. So if we have a physical network, that physical network is cabling. That cabling should not be exposed to the outside. It should be protected as well. Any of the switches should, of course, be protected. If we have hosts on our network, they should be protected as well. And that could be done by any number of different controls. Now, defense in depth has three specific types of controls. We have physical technical and administrative. So physical is pretty obvious, right? That's our security guards, our biometrics, proximity readers, could be gates, door locks, right? To the data center, straightforward. Technical controls would be firewalls, proxies, logic controls, could also be data loss prevention software. It could be MDM management, whatever kind of software we want to put in place. Then we have policies and procedures, classifications. So one thing to be aware of too is the military is really good at this as well is to make sure that data is protected but some data needs to be protected even more. Compartmentalized is a term we would use. So for example, any kind of privacy data is going to be protected with additional layers of controls. So when it comes to defense and depth, there's a triangle that's commonly referred to, and at the top is the data. We need to have the right controls for our data in place, our applications, our hosts, our internal network, the perimeter, the physical equipment. So for example, it could be our switches, our routers. Then we need to have policies, procedures, and awareness put in place. So we need security training. 
we need an acceptable use policy, right? And so how does all those layers come into play? What would be the controls we may want to consider? I have a list here. And again, for time purposes, I won't go into each one, but be aware that there's a number of controls we could put in place to protect our network. So in your organizations, look at what you have in place and determine what kind of controls they are. In summary, defense in depth is really about taking that macro perspective and being able to look at the controls that we have in place and determine is it going to protect our data, our applications, our hosts, but also too, when we're designing our network infrastructure, our software, we want to look at this as well and determine, do we have the right policies? Do we have code reviews in place? A lot of things go into defense in depth. Let's go ahead and move on to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's talk about network design. Now, when it comes to network design, it is important to realize that just like anything else we build, we need to make sure that we have all the proper parts, pieces, structures, etc. in place. So if we're going to be building a house, we need to, of course, have some kind of a foundation. We need to frame it. We need to, of course, put up the walls, the plumbing, etc. So when we think about a network, though, there's still a lot of pieces and parts that have to be attended to. Now, of course, a lot of that is beyond the scope of this course, but we want to make sure you understand that when a network is designed for an enterprise, there's a lot of planning and building that goes into that. We need to make sure that it's reliable, secure, and efficient. We need to have multiple redundant links. We need to have a lot of different security tools in place like firewalls and DLP services or network intrusion detection systems, you name it. One of the things to be aware of is generally when the network is designed, there's going to be a specific vendor that is going to be utilized. That could be Cisco, it could be Brocade, or now actually we would call it Broadcom. But just be aware, again, there's going to be some kind of foundational technology used. Now, when it comes to network technology, this is the physical layout of the network. And, and then when we look at hardware, this will be the physical devices. This will be the firewalls, the next-gen firewalls. It could be the routers, the switches, etc. Now, software, generally when you buy hardware, there's software that comes with it. We may need to layer additional software on top of it. Security measures need to be in place. We need to consider performance, scalability, cost. These are all things that go into the design of a network. Now, when we consider basic network architecture, we want to think about, again, just so many different factors. But in summary, we want to make sure we have redundancy built in. We want to make sure that it's able to handle the requests that, let's say, the applications have, that the performance is not too laden, in other words, too slow to respond. With that said, let's move on to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's talk about single point of failure. When it comes to ensuring that our network architecture, our cloud architecture, our IT systems in general, we want to make sure we avoid having any what are referred to as SPOFs. These are single points of failure. For example, having a single network connection to a switch is not a good idea. We want to have at least two, have some redundancy. Having a single disk in your computer is not a good idea because if there is a disk failure, then you will have some challenges being able to produce the data that you need to have access to the data that might be on that disk. Now, when it comes to avoiding single points of failure, we want to abide by what is called the rule of high availability. That means having at least two connections, two disks or two network ports available. Whatever that specific system is, we want to have redundancy 
to that specific system. Another great example is we don't want to program our network switches with only one route to, let's say, our data services. We need to have multiple routes in that router, for example. Okay, so when it comes to failures, this can happen for any number of reasons. It could be natural disasters. It could be man-made. It could be software, hardware, or networking. And when it comes to natural disasters, we also need to look at where we're located or where the cloud service is located, but also where our user base is as well. For example, if you are in the Midwest and your company has all their data services located, let's say, in Illinois or Iowa, Texas, even Oklahoma, and there's the potential for bad weather like tornadoes, then that could be a challenge. Or if you're on a river and the data center floods, and I've seen certain companies, I won't mention them, with data centers that are located less than a mile from a major river. Not generally a good idea. Another concern could be earthquakes if you're on the west coast or if you're in Japan or Chile. These are concerns that, again, I see pretty routinely. Okay, single point of failure. This is really, again, an approach that mitigates the possibility of a specific area in your design that could cause a failure if it is not available. Once again, this could be anything from network switches to network ports to routes. It could also be disk drives. It could be anything from even, in some cases, data services. It could be DNS is another common thing that can be overlooked. So we need to look at those specific things in our design to rule out any kind of single point of failure. Now, fault tolerance is the ability of a system to suffer a fault but continue to operate. We want a resilient system. This is really coming down to the fact that let's say we lose a disk drive and we have two disk drives, then that system will be resilient if we were still able to write and read from that disk drive. Now, disaster recovery is really about getting that important information and infrastructure as well to have it available when there is an outage. And then business continuity is really the process of how you handle getting your business back to where it was after there was a failure or disaster. With that said, let's move on to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's go through a short summary of the lessons we discussed in this module. Let's go to the whiteboard. In this whiteboard, let's go ahead and bring together some of the concepts we talked about in this module. Now, it's important to realize that there's a lot of things going on in the world of cybersecurity. And one of the things that companies do have nowadays is a hybrid environment. So they're going to have on-premise solutions. So that means they own the equipment typically. It's hosted in their data center. But companies also host stuff in the cloud. Now, I'm using Google Cloud as an example here. It could be AWS or Azure, Oracle, you name it. And companies are choosing one or more cloud vendors. And one of the things that we want to pay attention to is our cybersecurity design. Now, when we look at our design, our architecture, we need to understand that we're going to have a lot of different interfaces from how we connect on-prem to the cloud service. And this could be any number of ways. We could use a VPN, and that's a virtual private network, generally the cheapest and easiest way to connect from on-premise to the cloud service. Then there's also provision services that you can pay for as an enterprise that are more secure. They have greater bandwidth and better controls as well. Pairing is another option as well, 
And again, with peering, you generally need to have some kind of telecom closet to be able to do that. That again is an additional cost. We also want to consider setting up NAT for our services, set up a bastion host. So for example here, we probably would want to have our NAT and then our bastion host. Now NAT is network address translation. So one of the things as a cybersecurity professional that you want to think about is we need to mitigate the risk of hackers grabbing our IP addresses. And using NAT is a great way to help avoid that. So if we're in the cloud and we have virtual machines in Google Cloud, let's say, and they want to traverse the internet, then we want to make sure that the hackers can't guesstimate what that real IP address is. So what happens with that is that we get basically a pseudo IP address. And that makes it harder for the hackers or whoever captures the packets to be able to guess what that IP address is. And then a bastion host is going to be a connection point where we want to typically have our users or developers connect to that network or the cloud service. Now there's a lot of great things that we could design into our network security and I'm just touching on network. We, we certainly could spend a lot more time if we want to talk about host security or switch security, you name it, but let's just focus specifically on the high level networks. So we could implement everything from security groups, these are going to be firewall rules, to traffic inspection, to geofencing. Now this is where we want to identify where the traffic's coming from and determine if that traffic should be, for example, going into Google Cloud from, let's say, a different location. That could be in, let's say, Brazil. It could be in the U.S., China, whatever. So if your company doesn't have, for example, people working in China or Singapore or Australia, then maybe this is something you want to look at. Zero trust. So zero trust is a big deal nowadays. So making sure that every request is validated, there is no inherent trust. SAS, micro segmentation, and SDN is another great approach as well we could use, or great approaches I should say we could consider. Now defense in depth. This is, again, where we want to have multiple layers. So here we want to design not only from, let's say, the network level, but we also want to here design for micro-segmentation and SDN and geofencing, right? All of these provide defense in depth in one form or another. One thing, too, to think about is a CIA triad. So the CIA triad is where we have our confidentiality, integrity, and availability actually encompassed in our design. And we know that if we try to design something too tight, it could affect some other parts of that triad. So we want to make sure we have a careful balance in ensuring that we deploy our networking, our security in a proper form that doesn't impede on our performance, but also doesn't open things up to where someone could get in without multi-factor authentication or some of that nature, right? There's a lot of things we could think about. Okay, single point of failure. Now, let's say we have a lot of important applications uh, here in, let's say, say, Palo. So in Sao Paulo, Brazil, we need to have, by law, multiple copies of anything that's privacy related or corporate documents that relate to business in Brazil. So a lot of these could be compliance requirements. So what we want to think about is make sure we don't have any single points of failures. We may want to have multiple connections, let's say from on-prem to Brazil. So we might have multiple VPN 
deployment set up to connect multiple service providers as well. So I might have one service provider being, uh, and again, I'm just going to say here in the U.S., and again, the writing I know is a little challenging to read, but uh, it's AT&T. Number two could be, it could be Verizon, let's say. Now, if you're with an enterprise, you may be using a business form, a course of large-scale telecom use cases. And because of that, again, there could be any number of providers. But just as a simple example, so we have multiple connection points to our, say, Palo data center. Or we also would have multiple service providers as well to our on-prem. So we need to have multiple connections to avoid what would be referred to as a single point of failure. Now, what about having multiple regions? So in this case here, we could have redundancy. We have one copy here locally in the U.S. and one copy in Brazil. That also could provide a single point of failure as well. Now what about when we design virtual machines and storage, right? Again, we want to have redundancy. So with that said, I hope this provided you a little bit of insight into things you might be looking at from a cybersecurity perspective. Let's move on to the next lesson. Welcome to Module 2, Security Operations. In this module, we want to discuss what exactly is cybersecurity operations. We want to dive into incident response. We want to talk about what exactly is a security operations center and also talk about some of the roles you can expect that would participate in a SOC. I'll talk about what exactly is security information and management and how that can enable organizations to respond to potential issues quicker. We'll talk about threat hunting and then vulnerability management. We have a lot to cover in this module, so let's proceed on to the next lesson. Cybersecurity operations. Now it's so important as an enterprise, you have what is really referred to as a baseline of how you're going to manage and monitor your network and data activity. So you need to be aware too that every company will look at this a little differently, but in general, here is typically what I see. Typically financial companies and government agencies that are at a certain clearance level will really take this pretty seriously. And I mean having multiple layers of protection, having multiple layers of human monitoring, having multiple layers of software monitoring, and also proactive response as well that can be automated. Now, generally, we want to make sure we're protecting our digital assets. Remember, data is the most important asset to most companies. And because of that, if the data is leaked, it could really cause a potential liability concern for the company and its shareholders. So we need to have a security operations center really be able to monitor, detect, and analyze, and then respond to these attacks. So we need to have skilled professionals. We have to have protocols and advanced technologies in place. But I would also add to that, we need to have policies and processes as well, frameworks and best practices. And this could include as well any number of different tools and services. And if you're in the cloud, it could get even more complex because of the additional layers and then what is referred to as the shared security model in the world of cloud. With that said, let's move on to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's talk about incident response. Now, it's so important that we have a way to identify, to contain, to remove and deal with any kind of incidents that occur. Now, an incident could be anything that is going to be disruptive to our business. 
And as a large enterprise or even a small business, you probably would have a good idea of what could be disruptive to your business. So when we derive an incident response plan, we need to identify how we're going to handle an outage, how we're going to handle a potential hack or a virus, a network outage, right? These are things that we need to really put in play. So this IRP, Incident Response Plan, is going to be a document that outlines how this incident is going to be responded to, puts in place of procedures. For example, you're going to have a contact list. You're going to have specific tools in place. You're going to have specific support in place. And then you need to identify who is going to do what, how they'll perform their jobs, and it's so important from an IRP plan that it's very detailed, that there is a workflow to it. Generally what I've seen with IRPs is that they're going to typically be in a larger enterprise, probably at least 30 to 40 pages in length. And as part of that will be very specific instructions about escalation, about how to use the proper tools and how you're going to deal with this incident. And then what about if there's also, for example, evidence of a hack? How do you identify who to call? Is it criminal? Is it not? Is it internal, external, right? There's a lot of things that go into this IRP. So with that said, let's move on to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's talk about Security Operations Center. Now, the SOC is one of those tangible assets that the organization has. And what I mean by tangible is we could actually look and feel it and be in it and understand it's there. Now, not all enterprises have what is really referred to as a centralized SOC. And what I mean by that is that everybody's in the same location. The reality is, is that our enterprises, our larger enterprises for sure, are global. And you could have any number of SOCs dealing with very specific issues. Now the SOC itself, the goal of it is to be that point of aggregation for data that we're going to be collecting but also analyzing as well. And it acts as again, more or less an aggregation point, or actually in the world of larger enterprises, there'll be many aggregation points that will be looked at. And what I mean by that is the logs will be collected and there'll be a number of different tools that'll not only collect the information, but will also analyze that data as it comes in. And this can be done either via what's called streaming or via a batch file. So depending on the enterprise and the tools that are used, this data could be analyzed in near real time or it could literally take you know a day or two to get around to. It just depends on the organization and the tools that are being used. Now, what are the roles that you typically see in a SOC? Well, this is going to be typically what is referred to as a SOC analyst or a cybersecurity analyst. Now, our security engineers, our help desk people could even be in a SOC. It all depends on the organization. There isn't really a right or wrong way to set up a SOC per se. It's, it's really based on, again, the organization. Everyone's different and same thing with companies, right? So there are though best practices and frameworks to follow. And in the case of a SOC, like NISC has some really good documents on this. A lot of other organizations as well has put out really good information. The federal government has great documentation on this as well to look at. And with that said, just be aware of the SOC is, again, going to be an aggregation point, And it's going to be looking at the data, determining how to handle it. And I won't read the whole list to you, but these are just some of the duties that you could expect a SOC analyst to be working on from a day-to-day -day basis. With that said, let's move on to the next lesson.
In this lesson, let's talk about security, information, and event management, known as a SIEM or a SIEM. Now, a SIEM is more or less what we would see in a security operation center, and this software is really going to perform a number of different functions. The goal of the SIEM is going to collect and analyze data and look at it in a number of different ways. So for example, if it sees an invalid login, it might actually automate a, or actually be automated to send an alert to a security engineer or to a cyber analyst. And they'll need to take manual action on how to respond to it. On the other hand, that seam may actually see a virus and then it'll automatically quarantine that virus. So there's a number of different solutions out there and in a lot of cases, to be honest, there isn't really one size fits all. So in your organization, you may very well have log rhythm. You may have solar winds. You may be using Datadog. You may be using a lot of the common software that you'll see that could be programmed to do many different things like Splunk. So whatever you're using in your organization, you just have to realize that your seam may be able to perform a number of different things. And in some other organizations, it may be more singular than plural is probably the way I should put it. So the goal, though, of a seam is that it should reduce the MTTD and the MTR of IT security teams. Well, what does that acronym mean? So basically, that is the mean time to actually determine and resolve what exactly is the issue. So response time is really the, the best way to put that. With a robust seam, it's going to probably be automated in so many different ways that it's like literally a one-week class to understand all the bells and whistles. Now, I know just using Datadog, it's pretty challenging to keep up with from a monitoring perspective, never mind adding, for example, a Falcon Store or Falcon Star, I should say, or adding, for example, Logarithm and any number of other tools to your portfolio you have to learn as a cybersecurity analyst, for example. So with that said, just be aware that a seam, whatever you're using, is going to be commonplace and is really meant to be proactive from a tool perspective and really aids your ability as a cybersecurity analyst to do your job in a very proactive but also diligent manner at the same time. Let's move on to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's talk about threat hunting. Now, when it comes to threat hunting, this is a proactive method that we use to find what may be lurking in our networks, on our hosts, around our network switches, or in them for that matter. When it comes to potential threats, we could have APTs. These are advanced persistent threats. They're latent in our network, as an example, and may kick off at a certain time. We may have rootkits hidden somewhere. We may have indicators of compromise. Whatever that potential threat or identifier of a threat can be, we want to find it. Now, the goal of threat hunting is to really help us detect things before systems may find them or before the threat activates. This is really important because a lot of these Threats that have occurred and you read about the hacks online, they could have been probably prevented with the proper tools in place. Now, there's three main types of threat hunting. We have the planned approach, the unplanned, and situational approach. Now, the planned approach is going to be guided by the attacker. Now, this is where typically you'll have an outside consultant come in and they'll be generally an ex-hacker or a current hacker, maybe a good, good hacker as we would call them would be more of a white hat. And that white hat hacker will 
put together a plan and say, here's how we're going to work the exercise. And this is, again, sort of like a FEMA drill is, is another way to look at it. Now, unplanned approach. This is going to be triggered by generally a specific indicator compromise. This can be a simple example would be someone logging in from an unknown domain or someone logging in from a country that they shouldn't be logging in from or even log files have been changed or deleted, right? These are things that can indicate a compromise. Situational approach is going to be driven by generally an audit in a lot of cases or by an assessment that's been performed. With that said, let's move on to the next lesson. So I'll make this harder than it is. In this lesson, let's talk about vulnerability management. Now, a vulnerability could be anything from a network port open to weak passwords to even having applications that might have a backdoor in it. It could be older computer hardware that hasn't been patched. Whatever that may be, we need to identify those vulnerabilities and manage them. So we want to look at what we have in our environment and address those risks. And when we consider the risks associated with these vulnerabilities, we want to typically address the highest priority first and then work on the lower ones at another time. As an example, if we have an application that has a simple fix to it that we could do in two minutes without taking the system down, then that's something we could address pretty straightforwardly without any interruption. On the other hand, if we have to add a patch and then reboot the server, then that, again, has to be looked at as, is it a high priority or is it not a high priority? One of the best ways to understand how our environment is performing from, let's say, a best practice perspective is, do we actually run on our network basically a scanner? And this is typically referred to as a vulnerability scanner. This is going to look for open ports, weak passwords, protocols that shouldn't be running or need to be updated, whatever the scenario is. And the goal is to identify these vulnerabilities and address them. Now, it's important to realize that we're really talking about a high-level approach here. The reality, I think, is fair to say that every company addresses this really differently. I know from my experience working in the federal government sector, things are very strict. There is going to be really deep structure into how the vulnerability is going to be remediated, who has to be involved. If there is, for example, a system that can't be taken online because it manages missile defense, that's going to be addressed differently than if it's handling, let's say, taxpayer data or privacy requests or something, whatever. And that, again, can be handled very differently based on the agency. Now, if you're in the commercial world, generally you're going to want to follow the appropriate vendor practices, but also some framework as well. NIST is, of course, widely used in both the federal and also the commercial sector. All right, when we look at the steps, we want to look at for example, the assets, the roles, the tools, and look at the policies we have in place. And again, every organization is going to approach this very differently. Generally, there's considered to be a five-step cycle. We have the assess, prioritize, act, reassess, and improve. Fairly straightforward from a high-level perspective. We're going to first determine what we have, we're going to determine the priority. We're going to fix the problem. We're going to double check it's been fixed. That's reassess. 
and then improve upon our processes and practices so that we can mitigate that issue from happening again. We also need to have continuous monitoring of our security posture and vulnerability management is just one part of that whole schema that we need to have in place. With that said, let's move on to the next lesson. Welcome to module three. In this module, we want to focus on application security. What can we do to improve our application standpoint from a security perspective? First, we'll talk about APIs, application programming interfaces. We'll then talk about data flow diagrams. I'll discuss software assurance, source code scanning, and the software development lifecycle. We have a lot to cover, so let's move on to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's talk about API security, application programming interfaces. Now, APIs are going to be used pretty much in any enterprise environment, and for that matter, even small businesses. Now, these are really more or less connectors, and that's a simple way to put it. Another way I like to describe APIs as these are really interfaces of code that's used to bring on a connection. Another way to look at it is if we're driving down the highway, I need to be able to get my car off and on the highway. To do that, we have what's called a ramp on the highway. Well, these are basically on ramps and off ramps to the cloud service. So these APIs have to have a secure connection. They need to be managed properly. Sort of like if you have software on your computer, it needs to be patched occasionally, needs to be removed or updated, right? Whatever you want to look at it as. And APIs are no different. So there's different version numbers and to manage them does take some time and that's why we have developers usually assemble what's called a API gateway and this gateway is actually what is used to manage the enterprise's portfolio of APIs. Now APIs are going to be used to interface with the service to bring data in or bring data out of your enterprise. And because of that, they need to be secure, they need to be able to be managed in a manner that we need to make sure that we have the correct versions in place, that the protocols are supported correctly, and there's, there's going to also be some need for your development team to also review what APIs are needed and what are not. Because again, APIs can be very similar if you compare it to a computer, where you might have 100 services running on your computer right now, your laptop, and probably half of them or 80% of them sometimes you may not even need. So APIs need to be disabled or blocked as needed. Okay. When it comes to these APIs as different types, REST and SOAP are very common. And now the thing to be aware of is each of these use different protocols. So these different protocols are going to require a little different approach to managing them and making sure that that protocol is secure. Now, security measures that can be used can be everything from encryption to tokens to open authorization, etc. Now, an API gateway, as I mentioned earlier, is really meant to manage everything and it brings everything together as a way to enforce the proper management in our environment. Generally, with APIs, we implement what is called a zero trust model. We always verify the connection to the API and our enterprise. And because of that, we want to make sure that we have zero trust implemented correctly in our enterprise. So with APIs, we would typically use what is referred to as a secret. Uh, that secret 
in especially like in the world of cloud, we may want to develop the application and then have a secret that's used to be able to interface with that API. Now, again, there's a million different things that we look at and implement in an enterprise as needed, but I think that covers what we want to talk about in this lesson for this course. So let's move on to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's talk about data flow diagrams. When it comes to understanding how data comes and goes into our enterprise environment, DFDs can really help provide that insight. We want to be able to visualize this data from at least one or two perspectives. What I mean is have a macro and typically more of a micro view, so high level versus technical. This can be done with a number of different networking tools. And if it's more data focused, more than traffic focused, we'll want to, of course, have some manual help with putting that diagram together. So the goal of a DFD is to be able to show here is how the application works. When the user does this, the data goes from here to there. It goes through this specific entry point in the enterprise, and then it goes to this network or that network. Once again, these can be as high level or as detailed as needed for that enterprise environment. Let's move on to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's talk about security quality assurance. Now, it goes without saying that anytime we build a product, ship a product, we want to make sure that it meets the requirements that the customer has derived, has developed or specified for us, right? So what does that mean from a security perspective? As a security analyst, a security engineer, you may be involved with some aspects of development, depending on where you work and your expertise in certain areas. Again, this can vary widely. I will say generally what we would see is that the lead security CISO or security engineer typically will at least be part of a lot of development teams in the sense that they're trying to make sure that the development team understands some of the requirements that should be built into the software, like having specific password lengths, making sure that certain protocols are implemented. When it comes to security teams, You'll work typically with quality assurance, with pre-production, and look at how is the software design? Does it meet the requirements? Are there any bugs? Now, when it comes to UX design, this is usability. And so the experience also needs to meet that requirement. And when it comes to security, one of the things that should come into play is does the application, does it, and then this is actually pretty widely implemented nowadays, is does the application, especially if it's web-based, I should say, does it allow you to pre-populate with like your Chrome browser, let's say, your username and password? Now, generally as a best practice now, we don't want to allow that. We want the user to enter their information as needed. So these are things you want to look for. Make sure that everything is designed according to how your security teams, your development teams have worked together to specify. Micro UX design. Okay, this is a little bit different in the sense that we're really not focused really on the usability, to, to be honest here when we say usability. But what should entail here is that the organization should have a security posture in mind, and that should be implemented into the software. So we have the high level and the low level design concepts actually implemented into that specific product or service. Do we have the right password lengths? Do we have the right visualization? 
do we have as well the ability to lock out a user after so many attempts these are just some of the simpler things that from a security perspective could easily be added to software in most cases let's move on to the next lesson in this lesson let's talk about source code scanning when it comes to building out our applications and services it's so important that we scan our source code. Now source code is going to be the main code that is built by our developers that are going to run the application. Now this is generally in the back end and as a user you may not even be aware of how you're interacting with the application itself and that is okay. But be aware that when we build out these services, we have to make sure that we're following best practices, that we're really, in a sense, running an audit against the software code before we release it to production and we make any updates as needed. There's really four types. There's static analysis. This is going to search for common issues. This could be a buffer overflow. It could be authentication, you name it. Dynamic analysis is going to be where the application's running, and so when we compare it to static, generally the application is not in use, or at least being ran, and that's really considered static analysis. Dynamic analysis is when it's actually running. So, for example... For us to test out authentication issues, we generally need to log into it and, and try to, to see if we're able to do control C's, control V's, and anything else we have to do with that application to validate we're following best practices. There's interactive analysis. This is going to be where commonly the developers want to see if there's a way we get the application to react in a manner that we didn't expect. And then composition analysis, this is going to look for typically everything from API integration to, uh, when we say third-party dependencies, that of course could include APIs, but it could also include plugins and additional layers of software we add to the application. When we look at our source code again our developers are going to typically be hosting this source code in a repository and what's nice is a lot of these repositories such as git and github they have a lot of these tools built in however there's a lot of third-party tools and open source tools we could use as well with that said let's move on to the next lesson in this lesson, let's talk about secure software development. Now, there's a life cycle called the SDLC. This is a framework that's widely used by development teams. And the goal of the secure development life cycle is to make sure we build in security early on in the life cycle. Historically, when software was built, security has been sort of what we would refer to as an afterthought. And if we follow SDLC best practices and the framework in general, we will ensure that when we plan our software that we think about security from the first step, not at the third or fourth or fifth, right? It's about making sure that we design everything we need ahead of time so that we don't have to bolt something on now, bolt-on, when it comes to software, it means that we're really adding another layer that isn't really fully integrated, and that can be really uh, a easy fix sometimes, but it may not be the best way to approach things. Now, the SDLC is really going to provide the enterprise the ability to ensure that their development teams follow best practices, they have a solid framework, and that security is built in beforehand. Now, when it comes to the SDLC, it's really about integrating security across all the phases, not just the start or the finish or in the middle. 
Now, stakeholder awareness is really about making sure we address all the security concerns early on in the life cycle. And one of the benefits about the SDLC is that if it's implemented properly, we can generally detect issues ahead of time. And this saves us a lot of time and money from a development perspective. With that said, let's move on to the next lesson. Welcome to Module 4, Physical Security. When it comes to securing our data and our data centers, it's very important we have the right controls in place. Not only our data centers, but we probably want to make sure our offices are secure as well to make sure, again, that we minimize any risks of having a data breach, anything stolen, etc. So let's talk about IoT security, access control, social engineering, physical security components, and security personnel. We have a lot to cover in the module, so let's proceed to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's talk about IoT security. Now, IoT being the Internet of Things, and this is where we have a lot of different types of devices connecting to our network or networks. And these devices could be everything from mobile devices to laptops to even our thermostats to alarm systems to cameras. All of these things will connect to our enterprise network and therefore we want to be able to make sure that they are secure and are able to safely connect to the network. Now there's a lot of different challenges and this could be everything from not having the right security measures to malware issues to having also, interestingly enough, Bluetooth can be an issue in a lot of places because of the way it connects and it's short range. But another thing too is going to be about not having the visibility into the network or the devices on the network. And so we need to make sure we look at the proper solutions for managing these specific devices. So when it comes to these capabilities, we want to be able to learn and segment and protect all at the same time. And we need to make sure that our devices authenticate properly, that we use the proper standards. A lot of organizations for the mobile will, of course, have a mobile device management platform. When it comes to categorizing devices, we need to set up policies. And then also, too, we should definitely look at enforcing the rules and have what's called an AUP, which is an acceptable use policy as well. So with that said, let's move on to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's talk about access control. Now it's very important that your security teams, your security engineers, your cyber professionals have a well-defined policy as well as procedures in place to handle access control. Now there's different types as well. We have the discretionary, mandatory, role-based, and attribute-based as well. Now I won't go into the details of each of these, but generally what we want to see is that an organization is going to generally use what is referred to as role-based access control and assign that to specifically a job type. If you're an application user, you'll have application access, but you won't be able to modify the database that's in the back end, for example. You may be able to use virtual machines, but you won't be deploying them per se. So there could be any number of variations here for access control. Now, we generally want to have multi-factor authentication, of course, implemented. That could be anything from having passwords to using OpenID to using text to using Google Authenticator, RSA tools, whatever that situation calls for in your enterprise. With that said, let's move on to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's talk about physical security. Now, when it comes to protecting our data, 
and our resources in our companies, we need to, of course, have the proper controls in place. Those controls could be everything from cameras to intrusion detection, burglary systems, you name it. And it should be fairly straightforward to realize that a lot of these controls would probably be mandated anyways by either the county or the city, like the fire and escape uh, concerns, for example. But with that said, just be aware that we need to have the right controls. And, and those controls can vary based on, for example, where the data is and compliance requirements and a number of different factors. If it's a data center, we probably want to have some form of biometrics or a swipe card, which is known as a proximity reader, to be able to access those resources at a minimum. But with that said, let's move on to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's talk about security professionals. Now, cyber professionals are going to be in your organization, and they're going to be there to protect your enterprise's assets, your small business assets. And these professionals are going to make sure that you have the proper procedures in place, the policies, that you're responding to events, you're monitoring and managing. And this is also a great career as well for those that are interested in learning about cybersecurity. Definitely look at the additional courses we have on Tech Commanders as well. With that said, let's move on to the next lesson. This module, we want to talk about threat intelligence. First, we'll discuss what exactly is threat intelligence and why it's important. We'll talk about the life cycle, and then we'll discuss use cases, and then we'll proceed and talk about the different intelligence types. We have a lot to cover in the module, so let's proceed to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's talk about threat intelligence and its benefits. When it comes to protecting our enterprise networks, it's so important that we take a proactive stance. And part of that is the implementation of a threat intelligence platform. Now, these platforms could be from any number of vendors. It could be from Cisco. It could be from IBM. It could be from Symantec. It could be any number of other security companies. It could also be from large vendors like HP, it could be you know, Cisco, of course, and IBM have well-known platforms as well, as I mentioned. But just be aware that these platforms, and that's typically how threat intelligence is handled, is through the subscription to a specific platform. And these platforms will be constantly looking at data, identifying data points that your organization should be looking at, showing you the potential threats, that are outside of your network and really just trying to get you to be proactive. Now, when it comes to the benefits, any company can certainly benefit from these. I think the main challenge is for smaller companies, there's a cost to doing this and those costs can be substantial. Now, one of the things that I, I think should be discussed as well is that a lot of these systems, especially from if you have a Cisco network or you're an IBM user, then a lot of these can integrate with a lot of other different platforms and solutions as well. Also, too, if you're in the cloud, AWS has great solutions, Google Cloud as well. But with that said, just be aware that these are typically subscription services that will notify you of potential threats, but also provide you an interactive dashboard that you could drill into to identify what's happening, what are the number of threats, what are the type of threats that are occurring, and a lot of great information. With that said, let's move on to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's talk about threat intelligence lifecycle. Now, the importance of a lifecycle is to, of course, make sure that we have a proper starting point and a proper ending point. And the life cycle is really about making sure that we're able to understand where we are and where we need to go. 
understand how data collection should occur, understand processing, how to review the data, how to organize the data, and determine again how we can really address the concerns that that data may actually provide us. And there's certainly going to be additional things to consider as part of the life cycle. But again, just be aware that when it comes to cybersecurity, there's no, what I would say, 100% way of approaching things. So your organization may very well look at things a little differently than perhaps my organization would. So with that said, let's go ahead and move on to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's talk about threat intelligence use cases. Now, threat intelligence is going to be implemented typically by larger organizations. And the reason they choose to have a threat intelligence platform deployed is because of the fact that they need to put themselves in a proper posture to prevent issues from occurring in the first place. They want to gather that data, but they also want to identify as well potential threats that may not be an issue now, but could be later. So threat intelligence use cases could be for anything from responding to an incident that has occurred to increasing our operational security posture to managing vulnerabilities and preventing fraud. Now the financial sector certainly uses this extensively, just like a lot of the government sector and commercial sector. So one thing to be aware of, too, is that, again, these platforms, when I say platforms, they're more or less something that we're going to install in our enterprise, but also we generally subscribe to updates. And because of that, there's a huge cost. But with that said, just be aware that your organization likely has one. You may or may not be aware of it, so talk to your security engineering team. In this lesson, let's talk about threat intelligence types. When it comes to different approaches to managing threat intelligence, there's three categories, and it really is broken down into technical and non-technical audiences. So strategic is really focused into a high-level perspective of what's going on. A lot of this is really relayed via what I call dashboards. And so you get that visualization of here's the number of DDoS attacks, here's the number of potential overflow concerns or authentication concerns. So so these are the the dashboard views. Then when it comes to tactical, these are generally going to be more strategic is sort of a good way to put it, I think. And it's meant to be more technical. And then operational is, of course, technical. And this is looking not only inside the organization, but outside the organization. So when we look at threat intelligence, it's really all-encompassing. Companies need to have a really specific plan put together that's going to be customized for their environment because of the fact that this generates a lot of noise typically. <laughs> if you've ever managed these dashboards or had to view them, you'll see that like on QRadar, you could have thousands and thousands of events coming in literally and you'll have constant scrolling. It's just, it's one of those things that you really have to manage. And if you don't manage it right, you're going to be really going in circles. So just be aware that there's different types of threat intelligence out there. Generally, you want to provide strategic for your C-level execs, and then tactical and operational is more focused on your security teams. Let's go ahead and move on to the next lesson. In this module, let's talk about risk assessment. Now, when it comes to risk assessment, we're really concerned about understanding what it is and why it's important. We'll discuss performing a cyber assessment, and then we'll talk about risk management, 
cyber insurance, and then we'll talk about resources in closing out the course. We have a lot to cover in the module, so let's proceed to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's talk about what is a cyber risk assessment. Now, a cyber risk assessment is going to be an exercise that your security team will perform commonly with an outside auditor or an outside consultant in a lot of cases, but it could be internal, really depends on the experience of the team and funding and just a lot of variables. But in general, a cyber risk assessment should be performed annually and the goal is to really understand what are the potential risks of the current environment and then what happens if we add additional services, we increase the number of users or we add different capabilities to the network or we change vendors, right? There's a lot of things that have to be looked at. But the goal of performing a cyber risk assessment is to really understand what can happen and really assign some sort of a, you know, percentage, I guess is probably the best way to put it. It's not exactly the term we'd want to use, but it's the probability is probably the better way I should say that. And so the probability of a risk happening should be computed as well. And there's some great spreadsheets that you could get online to help with this as well. But when it comes to these cyber risk assessments, they do take a lot of time and it's a great exercise, especially if you're new to the organization, to really understand how the services work in the organization, how policies are in place and how do they work and just so many important factors. Now, what should a risk assessment actually help solve? It should help identify issues. It should profile risks. It provides understanding of the types of data collected. This is very important as well. And just a lot of different things. And when it comes to these risk assessments, this is something that generally needs to be done for your company to be insured. So if you have cyber insurance in your organization, Generally, this is something that needs to be performed as a result of getting that insurance. With that said, let's move on to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's talk about performing a cyber risk assessment. Now, when we perform a risk assessment, there's certainly going to be a lot of planning involved, a lot of understanding what needs to be assessed. And so we would call this the scope. We need to identify, are we going to test all of these VPNs or just a few? Are we going to check authentication on every system? What are we going to do? That's the scope. We also need to identify what are the assets and how important they are to the organization. For example, if we're maintaining data that is going to be privacy related information. This is data that really needs to be protected at a higher level because not only can we expose data and violate privacy laws, but you know, the company can get sued. And not only that, the company reputation could be harmed. And these are things that we don't want to happen. We want to identify the potential threats that could be there and also understand too that this is a real exercise and what typically happens is that if there is a potential threat and that threat is basically let's say more or less concerned with the development environment that may not take a higher priority than the production environment. So there's typically a number assigned to the value or the cost of, let's say, an outage. We also want to have the right controls in place as well, and we need to monitor those controls routinely. Now, in reality, these cyber risk assessments can bring in outside help, 
and it can take many weeks to complete depending on the scale and the size and what is actually being assessed in that organization. Let's go ahead and move on to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's talk about enterprise risk management. Now, companies need to manage risk, and this is done by typically implementing specific frameworks. It could be from ISO, it could be from NIST, any number of different options are out there. The goal of enterprise risk management is to have a systematic approach that is going to help us identify where we are and where we need to go. But it's also going to help us understand what the potential risks are that we have at the current time and then help us figure out ways to reduce that risk or to mitigate that risk. So when we consider what we refer to as pillars, risk can be either accepted, in other words, we leave the risk as is. Let's say we have an older application. It's running on a legacy system, but it's important for a specific task that we have in the operation of whatever we're doing, and so we choose to leave it. Avoidance is where we choose not to even be involved, and so that risk is removed. And then transfer is where we would typically buy insurance, like cyber insurance, to help mitigate the risk. And then reduction is we're going to actually perform some sort of action to reduce the risk. Could be adding patches. It could be improving the infrastructure. It could be training users, whatever that is. When it comes to ERM, it's going to comprise of a lot of different tasks. And I won't read these to you, but just be aware that there's a lot here. And these are just some of the areas that are actually part of ERM. Like if you look at ISO, there's literally hundreds of pages that you could be looking at. As far as some of the key points, it's really about really detecting, anticipating, acting, getting feedback, having the organization in place to react as needed, and again, it's it's really about understanding from a cyber perspective where we are, where we need to go, but also what we need to accomplish to mitigate the risk. When it comes to ERM, there's three specific lines of defense we could put in place. We have the first line, which is implementing controls, policies, managing risks, etc., then we look at supervising the first line, monitor the risk, and look at the design that we have in place. Then from the third line, this is where we have an auditor come in typically and look at how we're doing and provide us insight into how we can do better. So with that said, we want to make sure that we understand that ERM is an all-encompassing framework that we need to implement. And again, every organization will look at different frameworks and determine which one is appropriate for them. Let's go ahead and move on to the next lesson. In this lesson, let's talk about cyber insurance. A lot of companies now are choosing to have insurance to protect against a cyber attack. Now, this type of insurance is going to help the organization mitigate financial challenges with paying out a potential claim. And this is something that has been increasingly popular and definitely, as we probably have seen in the news quite a bit, these organizations are getting hit with multi-million dollar lawsuits and damages and not to mention fines as well. So this is a common way for companies to help mitigate some of the costs of having a data breach. Now, as far as the coverage, it can cover data loss, recovery, recreation, business interruption, income loss as well, and also to deal with any funding that's been lost or transferred, any extortion, 
And this is also something that you would likely see a lot of mid-sized companies and smaller organizations look at as well because of the protection against, for example, uh, ransomware or malware that can cause havoc as well. But with that said, be aware there is cyber insurance that's available for your organization. Let's move on to the closeout of the course. Resources and course closeout. Before we close up the course, let's make sure you're aware of some of the resources available with Tech Commanders. Definitely go to techcommanders.com and find the new courses, the new blog posts, etc. Also check out myblockchainexperts.net. We also have a GitHub as well and numerous content partners. Now there's a lot of great courses available on different subjects from FinOps to Google Cloud to security, you name it, blockchain, fintech. Lots of courses available for you to dive into if any of these are of interest. Also, too, there's popular ebooks available as well on Amazon, Kindle, and certainly check them out as well. And there's free infographics that are available on Tech Commanders for you to grab as well. Lastly, please be aware we have a new program that helps people get into the world of cloud computing called Cloud Interview Ace. This is a seven-week program that provides you direct coaching and expert advice around interviewing, preparation, resumes, etc. And lastly, I wanted to personally thank you for joining the course. I wish you much success in your career and certainly reach out if I could be of assistance to you in the future. Have a great day.